Isaac Herzog, the president of Israel, may describe it as atrocious and preposterous. Uh, and David Cameron may um, talk about the possibility that Israel has transgressed uh, international rules by withholding water. But the fact is, the South African uh, government case in The Hague has taken place, and even if no significant international um, politicians were present, Jeremy Corbyn is present, and he was almost the British Prime Minister, not quite, but almost, and um, I think the case against Israel is not very cogent, but it is getting significantly stronger. And Israel would be extremely foolish to ignore the growing strength of opinion and the move towards legal censure. So today it's South Africa. Tomorrow it could be a significantly stronger case which is brought against Israel using many of the same arguments. Nobody, uh, I, I think uh, Mr Corbyn has put, has put this very well, nobody can kill can call the killing of all these thousands of people and the destruction of 70% of all the housing in Gaza a proportionate response. It is an attack on the entire Palestinian population. That much, I think, is absolutely true. And the fact that it is done without any other international uh, military support uh, on the ground singles Israel out um, and puts Israel in a very inconvenient and difficult position. At the same time, Israel has done nothing at all to uh, sponsor the idea that it is acting in a civilised and um, thoughtful way um, with respect to the many civilians. The problem with a guerrilla war is it's almost impossible to distinguish the civilians from the militants. And by engaging in this war without due preparation, without international support, without international boots on the ground, Israel has put itself in an incredibly vulnerable position and a foolish position, uh, added to which the rhetoric which has been used by Netanyahu and by Herzog, by the President and by the Prime Minister, uh, is the sort of rhetoric which suggests a, a genocide. I don't think um, that uh, uh, that it's possible to link directly that rhetoric to the actions of the soldiers, though certainly uh, the sheer number of people killed is uh, catastrophic. Um, but I think that it, it will be that area where the um, where The Hague would have difficulty in drawing a clear conclusion and, uh, and drawing the conclusion that Israel is guilty of genocide. At the same time, there is an element of tit-for-tat, given the fact that uh, Hamas in their charter call for the destruction of the state of Israel, the only nation-state of the Jewish people, and therefore Hamas has already called for a genocide and could be said to have acted on that in their um, attack on the 7th of October. It's uh, w once it gets into a legal theatre, the arguments seem to be detached from reality. The reality, I think, one should always keep in mind is the sheer number of deaths of Palestinians in Gaza uh, and the anxiety, the terror of the current uh, civilians in the state of Israel. And I think there's a brittleness throughout the region. What, uh, what, what we could do is to encourage Israel to demonstrate its, um, its commitment to civilized principles those would involve getting the sick and the injured into hospitals which are working. 
those would involve getting aid into Gaza to help the civilians. Those would involve um, getting as many civilians out of Gaza and out of the theater of war as possible and resettling and rebuilding those areas which uh, have been destroyed. Those are the commitments that we should see instead uh, we're getting this sort of vague call for a ceasefire. A ceasefire is simply a part of the process towards peace. And it's one part of that process, a ceasefire. To call, a go <laughs> to identify a goal as part of a process is to get it all back to front. The goal is peace. A ceasefire might be involved in that process. But a ceasefire as a... Uh, as an end result that effectively describes the Treaty of Versailles and the end of the First World War and we know where that led to